Political time, political time. Okay. We have candidates running for mayor. We have the independent guy. Introduce yourself to the audience. Hi, folks. I'm Adolfo Carrion. I'm running as an independent for mayor of New York City. I was the Bronx Borough president for uh, eight years. I worked with President Obama at the White House as director of the White House Office of Urban Affairs. I'm a former member of the city council. I'm a Bronx boy, born and bred. I'm a Yankee fan, and I'm worried about the future of the city. I think we need independent leadership. We need an awakening. Unfortunately, guys, uh, thanks for having me, but I have to tell you the bad news is that only three in ten voters came out to vote in 2009 to elect the mayor of New York City. The sleeping giant in this city is the Latino community. Only 15% of the registered voters come out. The young people, even less of them come out. In black and brown neighborhoods, about 10% of the people come out. So folks, we need an awakening. If we're going to take back the city, the school system, build affordable housing, and do all the things we need to do, we, we're going to have to now, do some serious work. Um, oh, you, affordable housing, that was a de Blasio thing. You're saying affordable housing. Talk to us about your perspective on how this should be handled you know i think any responsible candidate running for office has to acknowledge that we live in a state of emergency we have a two percent vacancy rate that means if you're a working family or if you're just entering the middle class or if you just finished college and you're coming back home uh for the first time in a long time you're not going to be able to find affordable housing a lot of kids are going back with their parents squeezing two families into an apartment people are not able to get out of the housing projects because they have nowhere to go so we need to build housing to ensure that people can afford to live here my family came from Puerto Rico in the 1950s my folks came we started in poverty in a tenement sub basement tenement went to the housing projects we lived in Jacob Reese houses in the Lower East Side um, in 1969 we finally were able to squirrel enough pennies away and buy a house for $28,000 in 1969 the reason we were able to do that is because we had housing options to climb the ladder people don't have that so right how now. do you do that without screwing up my property value so, so if i bought in manhattan or i'm in one of these new high rises and you know i did my i earned my slot my salary whatever i went out and got my credit together saved my money maybe my parents kept kicked in a couple of bucks and I went and bought something nice. How do you bring in this? Because that's my biggest issue, is how do you keep from ruining my property value? I hear how, you. How, how can you make sure my And, and I think here? there's a misunderstanding about what um, uh, affordable housing is. What we're talking about is affordable housing for all New Yorkers. The one area that we have figured out is taking care of the poorest New Yorkers. We house them. Um, we don't house them entirely well. Uh, you know, we have a homeless problem. But when it comes to that moderate income family, that's, you can't even buy a place. You can't even rent a decent place because it's not available. So you're they, saying low income is covered. Low income is generally... Rich people, they rich good. people are we definitely good. good. The yeah. middle is like, where do we live? That's where, we, you know, we're losing, we're becoming hollow in the in the middle. And that's a problem because the, the a, a city, any society sustainable city needs a solid middle class these are the taxpayers these are the folks you know who provide some level of stability in neighborhoods they're not moving around a lot okay. because they have stability in their lives so where it's okay well i'm in man are you speaking specifically manhattan are you speaking all the boroughs where would this affordable housing go because now you have you know in the in the 60s and the 70s it was like the the american promotion was the white picket fence and the one and it was a one and a half kids in the suburbs yep. so then you had everybody going out to the suburbs and doing those long commutes now you have people making money who are like, listen, I don't want to spend two hours in the car every That's day right. or two hours on the train. I want to go one stop to work and go back home so they're moving closer in. Where is this affordable housing going to go? Let me just tack on that, onto that, that the reason they want to come to city, to New York City in particular is because it's safe. Well, and then there's that. And there's a whole dynamic that we have to deal with, which is public safety and the low, low crime. The fact that we had 52 million tourists and visitors come to New York City last year, that generates about 350,000 jobs. In the hotel industry alone, it's about 90,000 jobs. And these are real jobs with good benefits, many of them union jobs that allow people to get into the middle class. The problem that we have is that we don't have enough of a supply of good housing everywhere across the city. If you go back to the, you mentioned the 1960s and 70s. The 1960s, we built things like Co-op City, Left Rack City, Starrett City. And those were the places where families moved out of the projects. That was moving up when and you they got moved, out the hood. And they moved up to what was considered the moderate or mi middle income or lower middle income communities. And what we did was we we gave them parks, open fields, playgrounds, new schools. That's We know how to do that. We have to do that again for a whole generation of New Yorkers. And now 
what we have is this rising minority majority that is coming into the city and, and, and you know, rising up in numbers, and we're not providing that accommodation for this generation. We absolutely have to do it. And we can pay for but, it but without you, raising but, taxes. Right, but where is it? Where? Where would it go? Where would you place these people? So, so, so there's... Is there uh, areas of, of, of town where you think this would be a good... Because you were involved in the Yankee Stadium project. Yes. Correct? You yep. were the borough president at the yep, time? Yeah, I was the borough president. Um, which brought how, jobs and money and property value to that um, South Bronx section. There yep. was a park put in there. There's a lot of things came out of that. Where are you going to zone this affordable house? So, so we have these old industrial zones, like in the South Bronx, and, and you know, you come from the the, the, the Bronx, so you know that Port Morris, mm -hmm. Hunts Point section, uh, subways yeah. go out there. There's plenty of subway access. What we have is manufacturing left. A lot of the old industrial uses left, and you have these hulking industrial buildings that are empty. We should rezone those areas and make them mixed use zones. And guess what? A mixed use simply means a mix of uses that includes residential, light industrial, retail, and the hottest thing on the globe, which is high tech. The new wave for our city, if we, and we have to invest in broadband and make sure everybody has internet access. There are parts of the city that don't have internet access, including some of these old industrial areas. We need to wire these places up, give them the capacity, the high speed broadband, rezone them, and then we can go vertical. And these are next to highways, next to subways, and guess what? Next to desirable waterfront communities, uh, uh, waterfront areas. And many of them are 12 and 50 minutes from the airports. So they're w well located all across the five boroughs, we just ha need to be aggressive about it. Do you think there's a chance that at any point there could be legitimate affordable, uh, new affordable housing in Manhattan? Or is that almost afford Like, you're, we're just hoping for the boroughs. Manhattan's going to be eventually a lost cause where if you're not rich, you're not going to be there. Well, you know, it is increasingly becoming uh, a city where the, the rich and the very poor have a home, but the average person doesn't. And that's a very dangerous formula for the future of this American city or any American city. But I will say that everybody knows that it is almost impossible to live in Midtown, the, around the Central Business District, on the Upper East Side or on the Upper West Side, unless you have a pretty deep bank. And so uh, we need to start looking north of 96th Street. I mean, there there's still ample opportunity, and there are a lot of old places that, frankly, can be torn down because the conditions are so bad. Um, there's that whole neighborhood around Columbia University. I mean, even with all the controversy that, that, around it. Columbia, that's... That's right, near where I live. That neighborhood, it feels like it's going the other direction. It feels like it's going to become unaffordable soon. That's where it feels like that's going. Is the, the Upper West Side keeps stretching from 86. Now yes, 96 is like 86. And, and soon 110th is going to be like 96. I, I was campaigning, Rosenberg, I was campaigning on 137th Street and Broadway, and I see this mix, right, of people that, you know, the Dominicans in what we call Dominican Heights or Washington Heights, and then you see all these kids, you know, the uh, white kids. Like who, college kids. Yeah. Like who the hipster just, kids. The hipsters, yep. the professional, young right. professionals, all mixed in. So it is the city is changing. What we have to do is we need to make sure that we have a mayor who understands that reality and affirmatively ensures that we build mixed income housing so that you can live we, it, they're called communities of aspiration where a young kid who comes from a modest background lives next to a professional family and aspires to be a professional and to live in that positive environment those are the positive messages that we need and it's called mixed income housing we can do it it's been done before now how uh realistically at this i don't know if you guys have seen polls on this recently but how would you um, stand up to the presumed potential winners of the uh, Democrats, uh, de Blasio, or who it's looking like, or Christine Quinn. Do you know how you stand up against those guys? So, so here's the deal. The, the dirty little secret in New York is that in the primaries, a very small percentage of the people vote. And everybody says, oh, Lord, you know, what's um, th the, the, the person got a mandate out of the primary. Of the 4.3 million voters that are registered in New York City, per, you probably get about 500,000 coming out for the Democratic primary. You get about 60,000 coming out for the Republican primary. Um, I don't have a primary as an independent. I didn't have an opponent in the Independence Party. So come the day after the primary, it's an entirely new conversation about who the leader of the city will be. The question for us is, can we animate the voters to come out?
Now, we know that New Yorkers over the last uh, five elections have gone out of their comfort zone and said, you know what, we want a grown-up in City Hall who's going to really address the issue of education, really grow the economy. It is about a job. The best social program is a job. Um, we need to uh, 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 make sure that we have a growth economy with low taxes, and we need to keep the city safe. And so all the noise you hear and the you know arguments about, for instance, stop and frisk. Stop and frisk, um, I believe, is a misguided discussion. And it is a, we understand that the relationship between the police and the community is broken, especially the young men of color. It is broken. That has to be restored, but it's not going to be restored by throwing away the, the one tool that a cop has, which is the ability to come and say, excuse me, uh, hold on a moment, you're, you know, I suspect you're doing something wrong. The, the way that we're going to restore it is by putting the cops back on the beat, put them in, putting them in the neighborhood. When I grew up in the city of the 70s as a teenager, um, I knew my officers. They were on my, they, I, I played basketball endlessly. I played hours and hours. My mother would come out after dark chasing me to come home. Um, but the one thing she knew that there was a police officer walking in there and that he knew my name and I knew his. And there was a relationship. There was also a relationship with the storekeeper. We need to restore that. So was well, that, wait, so was that, so was that, is that saying that you are in favor of keeping stop and frisk around? I think we need to reduce it, fix it. I think it's overused. It's it's driven by uh, numbers, where the supervisors are just saying, "Go out there and produce more numbers." Look, w in the nineteen in in the late eighties, we had twenty six hundred murders one at the high point in one year in New York City. Twenty six hundred murders last year. We have four hundred fourteen murders. So that's dramatic. That means there's thousands, tens of thousands of people walking around today alive. Look at what just happened to this kid antique. You know. There's a reason we went after the guns and tried to press real hard against it. So I think sometimes we, over, we overreact and overreach, and then the politicians take advantage of our sen sensibilities. Of course we don't want the young teen to be pushed up against the wall and disrespected by the police officer. But by God, I'm a father of four kids. I have three daughters and a son. I want public safety. I want my block to be and safe. you're saying there's a fine balance. I think most of the issue with young men and the police is the disrespect. There you go. Right? And a lot of these dudes police in our neighborhoods aren't from New York City. That's another problem. There's a disconnect. And, and culturally, there's a disconnect, and they don't know how to talk to people, and they don't know how to address people. So I, I kind of do like, on the same page. But with yeah, you. don't you like the idea? Because I will say... Look, there's some of you assholes out there. Look, some of y'all are just assholes. Like, you've been standing in front of this store all day long, right? You and your six friends stand here every day all day long disrupting someone's store, but because it's a public it's a public corner, nobody can ask you to leave. Or you're standing on some man's stoop smoking weed. Like, you, you're just being an ass. But you, right? Bieber, you do feel that uh, stop and frisk could potentially work and that it shouldn't necessarily because the popular sentiment has become among Democrats and liberal minded people to get rid is, of it. The popular sentiment is we do not like the idea of criminalizing our young men early and treating them like criminals when they're not. That's where you put that's them on where the, the track. emotional yeah. Like, yo, he he's he's just a kid. Why are you treating him this way? Right. Now, he's saying, well, when I was a kid, you couldn't walk with more than th three people, three men together in the mall because gangs were so bad, right? But people who weren't gang banging understood, yo, I don't want to get confused with a gang member, so I'm going to act accordingly. If you don't, if you understand that you need to act accordingly because the neighborhood you live in has a certain problem, then you want to take it upon yourself to fix the perception of your neighborhood. If if you have a problem fixing the perception of your neighborhood and you can't act accordingly, you're a part of the problem, not the solution, you know what, in it, my it, opinion. It, it's, it's a two-way street and people have to take responsibility as well. I think, look, the police, there's a lot of problems, the disconnect, guys living in the suburbs coming in, they come in with fear, they're wrapped in a blue and white vehicle, they're, I call it drive-by policing because we reduced the police force by 6,000 officers in the last 10 years, so now we pack them into cars, we took them out of the precincts, put them into the anti-terrorism task force, we put them at ground zero, a thousand and a thousand, you know, that's putting strain on the local right. force, right? But then there's the other side, which is, we have to look in the mirror, we have to look at ourselves. And that's always a del delicate, you know, balance because, you know, a lot of the liberal politicians will say, no, it's some always somebody else's fault. Look, what I'm saying is the police have to do this right and we have to take responsibility for our own destiny. The fact there is nobody else that was shooting at that kid uh, on Sunday night except another one of the guys from the hood. And they were in a battle. 
and he's not cooperating with the police and they have created this culture in that environment and that's a problem now now you can socially analyze it and psychoanalyze it and historically analyze it but at the end of the day we have a dead child that's one year old that has to stop well he's here he's independent your name once again for the people. Adolfo so Carrion, um, former Carrion. Bronx Bull. Carrion, yes, a Boricua. A Boricua. Sa Saif, how do you feel about a Boricua mayor? Uh, I think it'll be rough. I think it'll be hard for you. Why? I think, I, I just feel like, especially because the mayor, from what I know of the mayor, is like a lot of the borough presidents handle a lot of stuff in their boroughs, and then the mayor kind of oversees it, right? And it, But the mayors are in charge of fact, in charge of the police force. That's right. That's the one. That's one thing I know for a fact. The mayor is like has heavy control over. You're gonna. I think a Puerto Rican mayor is gonna have a lot of problems dealing with cops who got to look at you as the boss and then are go deal with some Puerto racist. Rican kids. Are you saying they're racist? There are some racist people. Yes. Yeah. You know what? It's very. And it's interesting. like you. You're gonna have your feelings towards uh, adjusting and connecting back with the community, and they're gonna be like, he's one of them. You know what I'm saying? New York City is made up of immigrants. It is a city of immigrants, people from all over the world constantly driving through this city. There was a time when an Italian mayor was unthinkable. There was a time when a, a Jewish, Jewish mayor was unthinkable Jewish. or an Irish mayor was unthinkable. Um, and they would say, oh, the, the, the city's going to go to pot because most of the bad guys or some a lot of where the co crime concentrations are are in those communities. I will tell you this, and if anybody knows me as having been the borough president, if there's one thing that I was was tough on crime. We reduced crime in the Bronx dramatically. We did it in cooperation with uh, uh, Bill my cousins Bratton. are in jail. I know yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> we, we, went, we went hard, but we went hard to fix the neighborhoods to make sure that the, that the families uh, had an, a, a place to live that was safe. At the end of the day, that grandma yeah. could walk down the street, no, that the, the kids Bronx could walk is a whole to school. New place. It's phenomenal, but we can do it with the entire city. And and frankly, you know, I, I, I subscribe to the notion that we are one New York. At the end of the day, I, I, that's how I want we're not to familia. Be. And I think we can get there. I, I'm very hopeful that we can. There you have it. Young Adolfo, the independent. I like him. Let's I like young. This, let's see where this goes. Hey, we'll yo. see where this goes. We'll watch this play out. But you're saying after these primaries, after all the hype, the Blasio Quinn plays out, then we will see you, the Democratic candidate, and, and the Republican. And whoever the, is the Republican candidate? Whoever the Republican. Who is the Republican? Well, right now they have three candidates. They have Joe Loda, John Katsimatidis, and George McDonald. That's so, the Gristidis guy? Gristidis guy is um, Katsimatidis. Yeah. Yeah, call no, him I can't see it John for John Katz. I can't see it for him. Well, because of the commercial? Because it just doesn't look like a man. You need an Obama shot. The Can package, you get Obama drop? The, the, the package, an Obama drop. The package is difficult to pre to present with, with John, John Katz. He's a great guy. But, you know, I, I don't think that... Republicans have case. no chance in New York. It's a waste of time. Especially if they don't have a combination with an independent, you know? Yeah. So I took their oh, thunder So you're trying away. to figure out how to weave yourself in here no matter what. They're going to have to deal with they're you. They're going to have to deal with Either me, way, they're going to have to deal and with you. And you know what? 25% of the electorate is independent. 85% um, uh, of the Latinos don't vote. They haven't voted. They're registered to vote. They don't vote. A uh, similar number in the black community. So I'm talking about waking up the sleeping giant. Folks, we got to wake up the sleeping giant in New York, the silent majority. Um, do you have, speaking of, of uh, the population of New York, do you have any insight? Because we have a conversation often. Um, I believe in New York, because of how expensive it is, we're seeing a lot of black flight. We're seeing a lot of black families. And we're seeing it across the country. Detroit, Chicago, Philadelphia, black families moving back to the South just because it's easier to get jobs. Um, live in small town, better a schools. A lot of Puerto Ricans moving up North Carolina. Florida, things like that. Eastern Pennsylvania. Are you seeing that from where you sit? As Absolutely. far as the demographics. The, the, the concern with, with the future of New York City is that we're losing the critical population that feeds the middle class and that creates stability in the next generation. And the way that we here are sitting here together, you know, um, we came up in this city and we're success stories. Uh, unfortunately, we are more and more the exception. And a lot of folks are stuck. They're stuck in the projects. They're stuck in poverty. They're stuck in jobs that don't have a growth trajectory. Um, but the real deal is this. If we fix the schools and we need to transform them, we're not going to charter our way out of this mess. We're not going to magnet our way out of this mess. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to transform the neighborhood school. We're going to have to go high tech, introduce tech Thank into you. the classroom. Stop fearing the I didn't even know I liked this guy. Handheld devices. I just brought him up because he was a Latino candidate. There you go. And I was like, who knew we had a Latino candidate? It was go. racial. 
So the only reason a, I brought him up, it was racial. I respect him. But it's a gateway to just possibility <laughs> and promise. So, so, but the deal is this, and I'll end with this because I know we're running long, is the, the good jobs, there's lots of them in New York City, but they're high-skilled and high-paying. Well, and the thing not is, going like you just said, we're not training our children for we're the not. jobs of tomorrow. They're bringing people in from India and yep. other countries, giving them visas for six months, and then sending them back and rotating a new batch in. So you're saying, put these tech jobs, put all this tech knowledge in our public schools. Uh, wire the city, go heavy broadband, high speed, put it in the schools, do partnerships with, uh, with private industry. I want to do a growth industries council for the New York City public schools, the health sector, education sector, finance sector, real estate sector, and of course the IT, which is... So kids can actually be educating themselves to be able to get these jobs instead of giving the jobs... The best elsewhere. social program is a job. And that's my message from the day I ran for city council and now as a candidate for mayor. Thank you so much. Good luck. Thank I you, like guys. I this guy. Me too. Kind of, sort of. You didn't even ask him about snow days. <laughs> <laughs>